everybody, welcome to uh, this first of a series of uh, little classes that I'm going to do uh, for the app. Uh, my name is Lane Porter. I am the admissions director with Renaissance Ranch. I'm a therapist, and uh, there's a series of little classes that I like to do that I think are interesting. And so, for the benefit of this app, and for you folks at home who are using the app, we've, we've got these going. And so, uh, I'm going to start with. Uh, with uh, what I'm doing here. So today I'm going to start at the beginning. And when I say I'm going to start at the beginning, I'm talking, I don't know how many million years ago. Um, but I want to qualify first. I'm a scientist practitioner. I, I, that's how I kind of label myself. I like to follow the science. I like to speak about truth. I like to talk kind of in absolutes. Um, because I think there is big truth out there. Uh, I'm not sure that we know what it is or we can know what it is, but I think we can talk about it. Um, and so, um, so I'll try not to feed you kind of mystical, magical, um, nonsensical things. I'll try and talk right to you about things that you can understand and that you've seen in your life. But I will use a lot of scientific jargon, so ignore that. There will be no test on it. So, at the beginning. Two million years ago, five million years ago, whatever it was, our ancestors are walking around and they are hungry, you know, and they are horny and they want sex and they want to eat. So they are like every other animal out there. Animals have this brain, okay? And this brain has an area right here and an area right here, okay? And in it, there is a pathway. This area here is called the ventral tegmental area. Now, the ventral tegmental area is a dopaminergic... See, told you lots of scientific words. It's a dopamine area, so that means it is a pleasure area, or an attention area, even more importantly. Um, so this is a storehouse of where pathways are mediated. This up here, and I'll, I'll get into this, I'll explain. Right now I'm just throwing out some like baseline stuff, but I'll explain what all this means. This area up here, we're, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the nucleus accumbens specifically, which is a learning area, and it's an emotional area. So this is where we um, feel things like anger, or fear, or hunger. This area is pleasuring or telling us what to attend to. So this learning pathway here, when you touch a hot stove and you say, ow, that's hot, this pathway gets a little stronger and it teaches you, don't touch hot stoves. When you eat a piece of candy, this area, area pumps you a little bit of dopamine and says, hey, attend to that, pay attention to that. Whatever that was, give me more of that. I like that. And so it learns. So this pathway is a learning pathway. And it is called the meso, because this nucleus accumbens is part of the limbic system, so it is called the mesolimbic pathway. And it learns survival. It learns what is good for survival and what is bad for survival. And it does that on a very basic level. It says, seek short-term pleasure or seek immediate pleasure and avoid short-term or immediate pain. And that is it. It is no more complex than that. If it feels good, do it. If it feels bad, avoid it. And that is the equation for survival. Dogs have it, cats have it, lizards have it, mice have it. So mice scurry around, they find food, they have sex with other mice, they run away from predators, and they stay alive. That is survival. This part of the brain is where we learn that. And we are masters of it. Because from an evolutionary standpoint, we have been doing this for millions, if not billions, of years. To, get, to give some context to that, I'd like to give some context to that. Imagine that your grandfather had your parents, raised your parents up, to the point where they could have children and they raised them up. And their grandfather did the same thing. And their grandfather, and their grandfather, and their grandfather, back to when they were uh, apes, back to when they were, you know, uh, single cell organisms. You are the product 
of an unbroken chain for a billion years. The chances of that are one in a trillion. What that means for you is this is a very, very powerful part of your brain. It's an ancient part of your brain. And you are a master of survival, which means you are a master of seeking short-term pleasure and avoiding short-term pain. But so is the mouse scurrying across the floor that you saw, you know, the other day. So is the lizard on the rock. All of us are masters of survival because we've stuck around this long. We're still here. <laughs> so that shows that, that our chain was the best for, what, for whatever it was. Okay, so now I want you to go back to your, you know, your ancestor three million years ago, out in the woods, cold, hungry, no food. Okay, he is, he's sitting there one day and he's got plenty of food and he's got his, his cave woman, you know, and, and so he's got plenty of sex and he's got plenty of food. And he's sitting there and he's freezing to death. And he, so he stops eating and screwing and he looks over at the deer and he starts practicing something called observation. And he watches this deer and he noticed the deer isn't cold. And so he stops and he practices another new thing called thinking. And he says, and he starts exercising another activity called problem solving. How can I not be cold like the deer is not cold? And so he thinks, what if I could devise a tool? And so he starts thinking about tool making. And he figures out that if he takes a stick and he shaves it off and he straightens it and he takes a rock and he hits another rock against it and he carves it and he makes it sharp, he can make a tool. And with that tool, he might be able to kill the animal. And if he kills the animal, then he might be able to cut its skin off and he might be able to lay that skin off and drop. But all of this takes time and it takes patience and it takes work and it takes sacrifice. And all of these things are short-term pain. And his survival brain is saying, no, we don't do that. So this brain, it has to start changing. And so what happens is this other new pathway starts developing as he makes this, these tools. So he makes these tools and he kills this animal and he puts the fur on it and his brain has become a little bit different than the apes. Fast forward, I don't know, a few hundred thousand years, and he's got his coat on, and he notices, and he's sitting in the cold one day, he's sitting out, and he notices that no snow falls under the tree. And he thinks, now what if I, uh, you know, what if I could make the tree over me? And so he figures out how to cut down the tree and, 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 you know, build. So the point is, he learns how to kill and he learns how to create shelter. He learns how to um, uh, um, um, problem solve and tool make and decision make. And all of these things take a whole bunch of exposure to short-term pain. He has to sacrifice food. When he figures out that he can get the, the apple tree, to his house so his wife doesn't have to go gather. He can get to grow right here. All he has to do is take the apples, put them in the ground, care for them, and wait 10 years. That is not the avoidance of short-term pain. That is patience. That is perseverance. That is problem solving. That is decision making. That is tool making. All of these things go against his basic survival needs. And so his brain continues to change. And over a few million years, we have the development of a second dopaminergic pathway that runs through the emotional area out to this new area out here. Now this area, on Lane's five head here, is unique to human beings. It is called the dorsal lateral, well, for our core purposes, what we care about, it's the prefrontal cortex. But specifically, we are talking about the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. This is our executive. This is our self. 
when, when Preston thinks of himself, he says, hi, my name is Preston, here's who I am, here's what I stand for. That message is coming from here. He is an executive, he can think about thinking, he can problem solve, he can decision make, he can think abstractly so he can imagine what the outcome of a set of actions will bring. This pathway is different from this. It has a different equation based upon what our ancestors were learning back here when they were cold, back here when they decided to stop screwing and eating and start building tools, back here when they decided to stop gather, running out and gathering food and instead bring the food to them. Those things developed a new equation, a new reward equation because dopamine is about reward and attention. What do I pay attention to? What do I focus on? What do I spend my time doing? And how do I feel good about it? <clears throat> the way this one works is almost the exact same. It says seek long-term pleasure and avoid long-term pain. And here's the crazy part. How do, you, how do you seek long-term pleasure? It's almost always by exposing yourself to healthy and productive short-term pain. Work, caring for others, building tools, goal setting, problem solving, decision making. All of these things in the next five minutes suck. They're hard. Nobody, the first time they ever decide to work out, wakes up at 5 a.m. and goes, this is going to be amazing. And every one of us wakes up every once in a while and goes, man, I'd just rather stay in bed. And then part of us says, nope, I want nice things. I want purpose and meaning. So I'm going to expose myself to the short-term pain of getting up, getting ready, and going to work for the promise of success and purpose and meaning. So what we've got now going in on in our brains is a survival brain, a survival reward brain competing with what I like to call a thrival brain. This brain is not, this brain, our thrival brain is not satisfied with staying alive. The thrival brain wants something more. And so what we get, and this will be, this will be an underlying, I'm going to erase all of this. This will be an underlying um, kind of thread of a lot of what I talk about, is we have, because of those two parts of our brain, those two reward path brains that have different equations, that have different messages, we actually have a duality in our heads. And that is the human condition. Almost every dysfunction you can think about, well, every dysfunction that you will think about, every issue you've had, every problem you have, every inconsistency you're engaged in is, can be broken down to those two brains disagreeing on a situation. Those two brains taking control. So I want you to, th so, uh, so now, like, uh, one thing I want to quickly do uh, uh, for this part is kind of explain that. So what we have in this, so we've got our, we're, we're going to take this and kind of create two, um, two categories. Okay, we're going to take, and from now on, most of my stuff, the board will divide right down the middle, and we'll be talking about two, two halves to us. Okay, we've got our survival brain. It gets rewarded for eating that chocolate, having that orgasm, you know, doing that shot because it feels good right now, so you should do more of it. And it gets punished for uh, touching hot stoves, um, you know, uh, not paying attention at an intersection, doing the right thing. It gets punished for being patient. It gets punished for saying no to drugs. Because this brain just wants to feel good right now and not feel bad right now. So almost everything we're doing is helping this brain to cope with reality. Okay, so we're going to call him the survival brain. 
If you're watching this from a religious perspective or you want to find out how it relates to your church, this is your carnal self. You can also call him your natural man. We'll call this guy over here your actual or true self. But we are gonna we are gonna break him down in other classes. And there is a difference between these two fellas also, and we'll talk about that. But this guy over here is your actual true self, and sometimes your actual self actually ends up being more over here, unfortunately. Okay, but but for duality purposes, it can be over here. But he belongs over here too. So um, but he the actual self is the interaction between these. The actual self is actually probably somewhere in the middle. It's when these two things run into each other. <laughs> okay? Uh, you can also call him your natural man. And you can call this guy over here your spiritual man. Okay, so I want, when we're talking about the self, which will be a huge, you know, overarching topic in any therapy, but, you know, obviously in these classes as well, um, I'll frequently divide things into columns so that we can understand what our conundrum is here. Okay, so these two halves of the self, these two dualities, they are both still in our heads. You hear this guy is the guy in your head, usually with a positive message. He's saying things like, you can do this. You can get through this, brother. You're good enough. You're, you're powerful. You hear this guy a lot of the time in your head saying, man, that sounds too hard. Man, I'm not sure I can do this. Man, let's just sleep in. Uh, some might call this, you know, the, the voice that you hear, they might call this their higher power. And some might call this the devil <laughs> because the, there are voices attached to these things that send you messages. And they usually send you messages, this one's usually sending you messages to seek short-term pleasure and avoid short-term pain. And this one's usually sending you messages to seek long-term pleasure and avoid long-term pain. And again, I want to underline, the way you seek long-term pleasure is by exposing yourself to healthy and productive short-term pain. And the way that you avoid long-term pain is by, is by limiting your short-term pleasure. Because the survival brain, when it seeks short-term pleasure and avoids Sorry, I'm trying to uh, short-term pain. It does. It does not understand compulsivity, meaning it will do this to an unhealthy and exhausting level. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the study or heard of the study of the of the mouse that they fed. They fed this part of the brain um, dopamine hits, basically um, for all intents and purposes, electrochemical crack. They, they stimulated this part of the brain when a mouse touched a shock plate. So they allowed it to feel the, the equivalent of a, of, a, of a crack hit by touching a shock, by, t or by, um, by pushing a button. What they found was that the mouse pushed that button over and over and over again until it died. That is how reinforcing that feeling of pleasure was. It died of exhaustion from pushing the button because it stopped eating, it stopped sleeping, it stopped caring for itself, and it died of exhaustion. So then, because you know, uh, I, have a, I have another group I'll probably do on behavioral reinforcement and operant conditioning and classical conditioning, so I won't go into that now, but then, for, for the purposes of extinction, for understanding how do we terminate a behavior, they were talking about the effectiveness of punishment. So, I'm chasing a shiny object. By the way, I'm chasing a shiny object here, but I like this stuff, so you're getting a shiny object on me. Um, for the purposes of punishment, they, or, or to, to test the effectiveness of punishment, they, they modified it. What they did was when the mouse pushed the button, what it triggered was a shock plate. And that shock plate would shock them. And then, about three seconds after the shock, they'd get the crack hit. 
but the push and the button trigger, the shot plate, three second delay, crack hit. The mouse, what, what, Preston, what do you think the, mou the mouse did when it was getting an immediate shock and the crack hit didn't come until three seconds later? You know, I think after the crack hit, they're gonna, their brains, the last thing they remember that how good that feel, how strong the reward system is, I think they might be contemplating, should I do that again? Okay. That, that, let's, let's see that, that, that shock wasn't too bad. It was, that felt kind of good. Let's try it again. Okay. I know, that's what the mouse What did. do you think the, uh, over the, the, the course of the study per mouse, what was the outcome? Death. The mice still died. Mm -hmm. How did they die this time, Russ? By just avoiding it altogether, perhaps? They cooked themselves. Uh, mm. The pleasure always wins over the pain. That is why you're here as a client because the pleasure always wins over the pain when it comes to this guy. He is old, he is strong. We call him the beast. We call him the midbrain. We call him the dragon. Darkness, my old friend. Yep, we call him darkness, my old friend. And what he says, he works in this crazy, cyclical way to seek short-term pleasure and avoid short-term pain. He looks at his life, and he uses some of his information, because this thing is, is, is changing too, but it's a guard dog. It's stupid. <laughs> it doesn't think logically. Uh, let me give you an example of that. I'm going to tell another story. Here's how unlogically it thinks. How many people do we think have died of drowning in the history of the world? Russ, throw our number. A million. Okay, million people have died of drowning. Preston, of those million people that have dry, died of drowning, how many of them have died by holding their breath to death? Hmm. Probably not. Zero. The number is zero. Because the survival brain says, seek air. And it says, seek air. And you're holding your head up, you're holding the head underground. Seek air. Seek air. Seek air. Seek air. And eventually he overcomes your logic that says, no, there's no air under here. You will die if you breathe. And this brain says, I don't care. Seek air. Seek air. Seek air. And eventually it goes, <gasps> and you die from breathing. Because the survival brain is old and powerful. And it says, seek short-term pleasure and avoid short-term pain. And being held underground is uh, underwater is in the short term very painful and so eventually he takes over. This is also the part of the brain where addiction takes place. This brain has learned, we have falsely introduced a, a, a non-natural reality to this brain that delivers an incredibly pleasurable immediate dose. And our brain says, whatever that was, do more of that. And do it to the to the to the uh, detriment or or to the exclusion of all other things. And so we get that addict who says, you know, my life is miserable because I've been using drugs. How do I cope with this? I'll use more drugs. My family has left me because I'm getting high. How will I get through this? I know. I'll use more drugs. I am now dying because of my drug use. I'm alone on the streets and will soon be dead. How do I walk myself out of this life? I know. I'll use more drugs. It is not logical. It is not loving. And there is a reason that we as men have transcended this thought process because we have learned that there is something more than basic survival. This, chasing your, your high. And so, so uh, some of the stuff that I'll get into in future classes will be more of, this, more of this dichotomy. But two things I'd like to show really quickly on it. Having that high, having that cigarette, having that orgasm, taking that shot, they will bring you moments of this. They will bring you those five minute moments of happy. But we are men, we are not here to be happy. 
Men are that they might have joy. Joy is different. Joy comes from perseverance. It comes from patience. It comes from caring. It comes sometimes from putting yourself before other people. I want to give him a little story about that. We think that this, these are the, the aim. Our brain is so advanced now, at least on a spiritual aspect, that if you take the average man, even, even the guys in this room, the guys watching here, you have him walk out onto a, onto a, um, uh, onto a pier. And he sees a young baby, a small baby, fall into the water. And he knows logically, if I jump in that water, I can save the baby, but I am going to drown and die. Probably nine out of ten of you, maybe more than that, will jump in that water anyway. Because we have learned that there is something more than basic survival. We know who we are, we know what we stand for. And we will do those things very frequently to death. When we get caught in this man, we forget that. And it becomes about seek short-term pleasure, avoid short-term pain. And we forget what it is to be that man. In Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, he was observing the, 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 the folks in Auschwitz. He was, he was there as a, as a prisoner, but he was observing the other prisoners. And he observed who stayed alive. He observed who thrived, even, in this environment. And it was usually the rats and the thieves, the guys that stole from other people, the guys that told on other inmates, the guys that were willing to uh, push away their beliefs. These guys stayed alive. They stayed alive. Then he watched another breed of inmate. This was the guy who walked in with his head held up high. When he saw a child with no shoes, he took off his shoes and he gave them to that child. When he saw a woman with no blanket, he took off his blanket and he gave it to her. When the cops came in and said, who stole the food? He raised his hand and said, it was me. Victor Frankl proposed that these people, or, or, or he reported these people died. They didn't make it out. What else he proposes is that they were never imprisoned in the first place. Because they knew what they, who they were. And they knew what they stood for. And that wasn't going to change what they did. To wrap up session one, we know who we are. Or we're learning who we are. The, the purpose is to recognize that we are divine, that we have a higher self, and to reconcile him with the world around us that may be painful, hard, difficult, to transcend that basic survival that the rats and the lizards and, and honestly the addicts are engaged in, and even, and even the normies, <laughs> that basic survival that's kind of shallow and meaningless, and to find deep purpose and meaning and deep joy. And I hope that this helped with that, and we'll see you in section two.